which um, <coughs> we all feel happy in my slogans, but so go. Okay, it's in the, on the front floor. It all makes a lot of interesting images on the live stream. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, welcome again for this Saturday, Saturday morning session, which is dedicated to Thatic Perspectives, a very large term, and I'm very happy to welcome as our first speaker, Professor Wang Wu from Hangzhou University, more or less. <laughs> I'm very grateful that my Chinese students always start laughing when I try to pronounce anything, and when I then say, but it's, I say exactly what you say, they say no. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so Professor Rong is going to talk to us about ancient Greek drama on Chinese stages, lifeness, impression, distancing effect. So please. Uh, I think we, we can adjust the light so that the yeah, that would be good. More yes. <coughs> I'm just going to try some combinations. I think that's a nice compromise. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. Good morning, everyone. I'm very happy to uh, be here and to present my paper on ancient Greek drama on Chinese stage. Uh, it's a long way for me to come here. It took me about uh, 14 or 15 hours <laughs> of flight. And also my visa was delayed for two days, so I just came here yesterday uh, evening. Uh, so as to uh, my paper, I would like to uh, introduce uh, it in uh, three parts. And firstly, a brief introduction to the history of the Chinese performing of ancient Greek drama. And secondly, let's see how Pritchett uh, gets inspiration from watching of Chinese theater uh, with his theory of a distancing effect. And finally, I will have analysis or case study and let's see how uh, Chinese directors adapted the Greek uh, drama uh, onto the stage of uh, traditional Chinese opera. And uh, in that performance, uh, we'll see how the director uh, made use of uh, so-called the uh, distancing effect, uh, as well as uh, uh, some integration of uh, Chinese theoretical uh, techniques to get Chinese audience both detached and uh, familiar with uh, Greek drama. Uh, so the Chinese performing of ancient Greek drama has undergone uh, a change. Firstly, we have spoken drama, and that's Hua Ju, and to the traditional Chinese opera style of uh, performing uh, ancient Greek drama on the stage of uh, Chinese theater. Uh, in 1986, the first premiere of Oedipus the King on Chinese stage marked a milestone in the Chinese performing history of ancient Greek theatre. Let me show you uh, a picture of this uh, performance, uh, Oedipus. And uh, gradually, uh, Chinese artists uh, managed to uh, adapt the, the Greek drama onto the Chinese stage with, in the form of traditional Chinese opera style. And in 1986, that's the first uh, performing of Greek drama in traditional Chinese opera on Chinese stage. And this uh, media, and this uh, Jason, and this media. And then in 2000. Uh, Two, uh, we have uh, performing of uh, Sibers. Uh, both the uh, dramas are performed in the form of uh, the Hebei Bounce Opera. And then in 2014, uh, we have Orest, uh, Oresteia, a, 
adapted in Qingqi Opera. And, and now I'd like to say a few words about uh, traditional Chinese opera. A, Chinese, a traditional Chinese opera, Greek drama, and Indian Sanskrit drama are the three oldest uh, theaters in the world. And traditional Chinese drama is a composite, a synthetical performance art uh, that is an uh, uh, amalgamation of various art forms that exist in ancient China and evolved gradually over more than a thousand years, and reached its mature form in the 13th century during the Song Dynasty. And the early forms of Chinese theater are very simple, but over time they incorporated various art forms such as music, song and dance, martial arts, and acrobatics, as well as literary art forms to become a rich uh, synthesis of art. And the main features of traditional Chinese operas can be summarized in three aspects. The firstly, it's synthetical. Secondly, it's metaphorical, not very presentational or realistic, and formulaic. And we can see a picture uh, to uh, give us some idea of Chinese theater in the 18th century in Suzhou city, that's uh, uh, in the southern part of China. The second part is about how Bridget gets, uh, get, got inspiration for his theory of distancing effect. And uh, Bridget is a very famous poet, uh, dramatist and uh, director, uh, in Germany in the early 20th century, first half 20th century. And in 1935, uh, Mr. Mei Lanfang, uh, who was a very famous uh, Peking opera artist uh, who visited Europe, Latin America, Japan, and the United States. And he made a grand tour of uh, his performance. And uh, he's a, 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 a kind of genius uh, artist uh, that's uh, his performance on the stage. And he made acquaintances with Charlie Chaplin and, uh, as well as Bridget. And after Bridget watched the performance of Mei Lan Fang, and he got some inspiration for his theory of the distancing effect. And uh, later on, he uh, put forward some uh, techniques of distancing effect into his own directing and writing of plays. And the techniques of distancing effect uh, include speaking the, the stage uh, directions out loud, addressing the audience direct as both actor and the character, and gesture with attitude. In Chinese traditional opera, there are many formulaic gestures. Uh, used to indicate inner feelings, uh, such as for the male character, if he was very angry, and uh, in traditional Chinese opera, the male character has long hair and uh, plates, and he can just wave his head violently to, to, to indicate he, he's very excited or he's, uh, he's very angry. So there are uh, quite many uh, formulaic uh, gestures to indicate inner feelings of the characters. And also there are some grotesque stereotypes. For There are clowns, and there are uh, villains, and there are just some set action or set uh, paints on their faces to indicate the identity of the certain characters. And also, some exaggerated paints on opera performer's face to symbolize the character's role, whether he's a hero or he's a villain, and his fate, whether tragic or comic, and illustrate the character's emotional state. A gen a general character, like it's quite like masks used in ancient Greek drama. And also, there are very minimal props. And they, in, in Chinese states, before the introduction of uh, Western drama, um, we had very minimal props and uh, sometimes just uh, uh, 
a, a, a table and two chairs, and they can symbolize different settings. And uh, also, we use very minimal props to uh, indicate some realistic uh, environment. For example, uh, the captures can just use a, a horse whip to indicate his riding horse, or he just use an oar to indicate his, uh, his rowing boat. So uh, there are many minimal uh, uh, props uh, in Chinese theatre. And uh, finally, we have multimedia. Just like I said, the traditional Chinese opera is a composite art of singing, dancing, uh, music, uh, acting, and martial arts, even acrobatics. So for the application of the distancing effect into the directing and writing play for portraits, uh, intend to achieve the following ends. And firstly, uh, he intends his uh, uh, modern plays to be presentational and therefore very similar, close to a Greek drama. And secondly, the message must be clear and Pritchett didn't want his audience to be emotionally involved. And in his opinion, the audience must remain critically aware uh, in order to alienate the audience and keep them from becoming emotionally involved in the performance. So in this way, the, the use of a distancing effect in the drama is to remind the, the spectator the play is a representation of reality and not reality itself. And for uh, the, the final part of my paper is about the Chinese performing of ancient Greek drama in the case study of Herbie Bond's opera. And Herbie Bond's opera came into being during the Qing Dynasty in early 19th century. And it's good at the presentation of historical subjects. And the scenic style of this opera is high pitched, and very vehement, very strong, and sometimes tragic and expressive and very elegant. So the general scenic style of this opera uh, is quite uh, corresponding to the styles of Greek drama, sublime and grave. In 1989, uh, the performance of media was the first adaptation of uh, traditional Chinese opera of Greek drama. And uh, with this direction, uh, we can find the director managed to achieve the integration of traditional and modern theater, as well as Eastern and Western staging principles. And in the performance of this uh, opera, uh, we can find the, uh, the effect of loudness in uh, breaching distancing effect. And the director is Mr. Uh, Luo Jinling. And Mr. Luo Jinling uh, was born in a uh, family background uh, with a long history of exchange between Greek uh, culture and uh, Chinese culture. And his father is a very famous translator of the Greek drama into Chinese, very influential his Greek translation. And he is a director of Greek drama onto the Chinese stage. And his uh, daughter later on became a teacher in Greek uh, universities and uh, did a lot of it. So the three generations of uh, Lewis family did uh, uh, great, made a great contribution to the change of Greek and the Chinese uh, cultures. Uh, with this performance, uh, we can find the application of some uh, British uh, techniques and such as the exaggerated pants on the performer's face, functioning as a wearing of masks in ancient Greek theater. And secondly, we can find multi functions of a chorus. And in this performance, we can find the uh, various functions uh, of chorus. And sometimes they serve as, uh, 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 as a chorus similar to the Greek drama to introduce the general plot, the background information, or even some pre prediction for the fate of the, the heroes and heroines. And sometimes they can serve as characters in the opera. Uh, so uh, chorus in this play had 
uh, played many different roles. And also, it's the minimal use of the crops. Just now, I'll give you some examples. The use of horse weight as a, to indicate the capital riding horse, and the use of ball to indicate the captor's rolling boat. And then the Greek names of captors uh, remained in the performance to remind the uh, Chinese audience this is a Greek drama, not a, a Chinese play. And some formulaic actions, uh, such as long live dance and uh, uh, some other formulaic gestures. Uh, on the uh, second hand, uh, and we can find the director, Mr. Luo, made use of uh, some other adaptations to achieve the effect of loveness and familiarity to Chinese audience. And firstly, uh, we found the use of indigenous opera. Just now I said Hebei Bounce is a local and native uh, opera style in northern part of China. So the uh, singing of opera instead of uh, contemporary speech. And uh, secondly, we found the use of a traditional costume to make Chinese bodies feel uh, rather familiar and intimate. And certainly, adaptation of the theme of the play. In the original Greek drama, the God's will and the manipulation of gods are the dominant forces for the fate of the main characters. And while in Chinese adaptation of opera and media, and, uh, this God's will and uh, manip manipulation of gods are uh, omitted. Uh, the fate of the captors are mainly driven by the desire and passion of the captors. And also in the adaptation of this opera in Chinese stage, and the directors uh, managed to remind the audience of another play, very traditional and very popular Chinese play with uh, similar plots. Uh, in Chinese play, we have uh, 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 a play originated in Song Dynasty, and uh, the title is uh, uh, Chen Shili and Qin Xiangnian. In, in that play, uh, uh, Qin Xiangnian is a lady who worked very hard uh, to support uh, her husband to become successful in the imperial examination. Now, after her husband was successful, he abandoned uh, his family and even asked his, uh, his guards and the servants to, in, in order to pursue his wife, uh, even to, in order mm -hmm. to kill them, uh, in order to marry another rich, uh, rich family, right? So uh, the director uh, strengthened or uh, reinforced this plot, love and betrayal, uh, to make a Chinese audience feel intimate to this uh, play. And then we have revision, uh, revision of the plot, just now uh, some, something omission, and uh, some plots are added. In original Greek grammar, uh, the play just started from uh, Medea's revenge on Jason. And uh, in this play, uh, on Chinese stage, the director added the two plots, two acts, two episodes. The first episode is about how uh, Media and Jason fell in love with each, with each other at first sight. And uh, secondly, how Jason returned to homeland and how Media saved him from the, uh, the, the, the trap of the old king. So in this way, the audience, the Chinese audience can have some idea uh, to, to, to see why uh, Media uh, later on was angry with Jason. And finally, we found the excellent <coughs> application of music to, uh, to, to, to correspond to the feelings of captors. And sometimes we have very happy music uh, when media fell in love with Jason and they, uh, they, they, they uh, are happy with each other and we can hear the very exciting and happy music. And when media was very angry uh, upon the betrayal of Jason, and we can find we, we can hear some uh, vehement and uh, and very uh, 
refinement in music. So all these techniques, techniques are applied to achieve the effect of familiarity for Chinese audience. Now we can find this is uh, a, so in this way, a, the performance of media on Chinese effect uh, on Chinese stage uh, managed to achieve the integration of aesthetic as well as moral uh, purposes. So I wonder if I still have any just three minutes. Or I don't know whether we can just watch uh, a little bit of the <laughs> performance. So we need to just uh, click. Yeah. We need to suffer from some uh, commercials first. <laughs> <laughs> Oh. Distancing the captains. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, it doesn't work. <laughs> so, uh, uh, yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, okay, and uh, thank you for your attention. Oh. <laughs> yeah. uh, this is uh, the city that I come from. Very beautiful city. Okay. Somebody. Thank you. An advertisement for the next <laughs> ISIS conference. Right, right. So <laughs> yeah. you just leave it on and, and uh, everybody will watch it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. So we have some time for questions and discussion. Mm -hmm. Like? Otherwise, I, I have a very direct and, and I'm very sorry, very ignorant question. That is, um, where exactly does the distanciation then play? Is it the Greek element that is distancing an experience of Chinese theater for the audience? Or is the Chinese element indeed creating a distancing effect towards, in, with regard to the Greek dramas? In other words, how familiar um, would audiences be with the, the, the Greek drama when watching that kind of a, of a, of a performance? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. yeah, it's rather complicated for uh, Bridget's uh, distancing effect and some of his idea of distancing effects actually are not Distancing to Chinese audience, mm -hmm. and for example, some formulaic uh, uh, performance and actions, mm -hmm. the Chinese audience are very familiar with that kind of formulas. Uh, but in the adaptation of media, the uh, director made use of a chorus, mm -hmm. a function chorus that is rather new to Chinese audience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and also the 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 the. the uh, the general plot and the, the remaining of the Greek names are quite uh, mm -hmm. uh, distancing to Chinese audience. Yeah. So, but um, I mean, the, I was just wondering about the, the pronoun, pronunciation then of these names in in, in the Chinese. Uh, yeah, we we have uh, the literal translation. Mm -hmm. uh, media, media, mm -hmm. and uh, Jason, uh, Ya Song. Mm -hmm. okay. But still, we feel it's a foreign name, mm -hmm. not a typical Chinese Chinese name. name. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And also, some, some very beautiful performance of acrobatics mm -hmm. and martial arts and the long mm -hmm. sleeve. So, to, 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 we, we just appreciate, we feel it's beautiful. Uh, so in this way, also a kind of a distance you can appreciate. You, you don't get emotionally involved. You don't. You, sometimes you need to feel worried about the fate of the hero or heroines. Yeah. 
that actually relates to, to my question because you, you called it an amalgamation and a synthesis mm -hmm. of different art forms. Mm -hmm. But is it indeed then a, a synthesis or is it still that the different art forms to a certain extent are very much on their own? So that it is a kind of fragmentation instead of really implicating in such a way that. Uh, for Chinese audience, I, I think that uh, the idea of uh, compositeness is uh, is just rooted in Chinese mentality. Yeah. Because when we watch opera, we don't feel we don't separate it into mm -hmm. which part is action, which part is singing, or which part is music. We just feel they are going on simultaneously. Okay. So that's yeah. why I would like to show yeah. you an episode. Mm. <laughs> yeah. So uh, usually we say the, the Westerners like to separate and analyze, mm. and uh, for Chinese mentality, sometimes we just feel it's united. We we don't uh, tend to separate which part uh, is what. Mm. And you mentioned Brecht. I I I always thought Brecht. Mm -hmm. was in particular uh, fascinated by the specific mode of acting mm -hmm. uh, in, in China, yeah, in yeah. which he saw mm -hmm. uh, the possibility to present the actions on stage in such a way that they more or less become emblematic, or mm -hmm. instead of in one way or the other, suggesting a kind of lifelike realism, so to say. Mm -hmm. So he saw it as I understood as a kind of emphasizing the distance between the performer and the character. Mm -hmm. uh, just now I mentioned some techniques uh, applied mm -hmm. into modern writing of Cratchit. Uh, mm -hmm. Sometimes the, 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 prefer, the performers, uh, they the actors and just read the, uh, the directions loud. Mm -hmm. And then he served as both characters in the play and some kind of directors or sides to distance himself mm -hmm. from the performance. And uh, the Chinese opera is very representational or, or we, we say metaphoric. We don't use a lot of props. Um, sometimes on the stage, there seems nothing. Just uh, the captors made use of their excellent uh, acting to make the audience imagine what is happening or where it is happening. So the audience need to think more or create more in enjoying the performance. But, but it's very ironic. While uh, Pritchett learned a lot from the traditional Chinese opera in early 20th century, and uh, Chinese artists learned a lot from the performance of the Western theatre. Just like I say, drama that's only made by speech, that's quite new. That's, that didn't exist in, mm, yeah. on Chinese stage. Okay. We just learned it on the, in, in the early 20th century. Yeah. Yeah, and also realistic. Uh, props, yeah. words, yeah. yeah. So that's the dynamic exchange but between West and East. I understand you correctly that uh, on the one side you you say that the, the Chinese way of acting is quite formula. It's formulaic, formulaic yeah. Formulaic, mm -hmm. sort of highly conventionalized and stylized. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But it doesn't necessarily mean that. Of, but does it? If you know that language, mm -hmm. then it doesn't avoid the possibility to. Feel the kind of distanced. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So just oh. now I said uh, that that's for the distancing to, to understand the distancing effect, and we need to, uh, to 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 distinguish for for Western audience some effects are distanced, are distancing, but maybe for for Chinese audience we will feel intimate and uh, close and yeah. and uh, more familiar. Yeah. 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 yeah okay. But yeah. for that formulaic such as the weaving of the yeah, male characters yeah, for yeah. the 
what's the audience? You don't know what, what's wrong with the character, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. You feel distanced, yeah, right? Yeah. But for yeah. if you know the convention, mm. then, then you can understand the, yeah. the opera more easily. Yeah, yeah. That's right. Could one then say that, in fact, Brecht's distancing you, well, he, he, he uses, of course, these techniques because they are very different from what traditional European mm -hmm. theater was doing at that time. Mm -hmm. But in a way, there's also something like a misunderstanding of the original Chinese context because he takes as something that is, in a way, analytical. Mm -hmm. Which originally mm -hmm. is very synthetic. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, okay. mm -hmm. Yeah. But he also uh, noticed mm -hmm. the synthesis of okay. Chinese opera. So mm -hmm. later on, he uh, wrote some poems into his play with mm -hmm. uh, the accompaniment yeah. of music. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Then we can come going back on the live stream. Okay, then we have our second speaker now, who is uh, David Saint Jean Raymond from the University of Montreal. No, I can't say that. From the University of Montreal. <laughs> the University of Montreal it doesn't exist on the board. Has explained that to me very insistingly. So. Uh, Don Chiso from the University of Montreal, where he is uh, working on his PhD, and at the same time, also the technological wizard of <laughs> Qi and of uh, thickness. And um, he is going to talk to us about the artifice of a rhetoric of identity, the case of the trilogy, Trois of many Soleimani. Thank you. <coughs> so, Greetings to everyone present for this communication and hello to potential live streamers. I must warn you that like many of us, I suppose English is not my first language. As such, I will most probably be relying on my written, te written text for this communication to ensure I do not go too much off the path <laughs> I prepared. Otherwise, you would soon find out that my spontaneous use of English is somewhat hesitant. I will also apologize for not having a PowerPoint presentation because I felt making slides with quotes I will end up reading anyway wasn't the best demonstration of my technological abilities. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I must also warn you that most of the quotes I will mention in the following communication come from sources that are all written or played exclusively in French. As such, most of these references will be fully translated by me to make sure the audience can follow without the interference that might be provoked by switching back and forth between languages. Since the internet seems to agree on the fact that Canadians are very prone to apologi apologizing and French Canadians always raise issues about language, I believe the fact declaration is probably the most needed thing you can experience outside of spending the winter, se the winter season motor skiing. <laughs> What I propose today is the beginning of a case study on a trilogy of theater plays by actor and playwright Mani Soleil Manlou, a, a trilogy simply named Trois, which means three in English. The three plays that make the whole trilogy follow the, the same simple naming con convention. First, there is un, one, then deux, two, and finally, trois, or three. As these titles do not reveal much about the plot or the staging of the plays, I believe a quick summary for all three of them is in order. In Urm, Soleiman Lou himself takes the stage and in, a, in an about hour long monologue, describes the process that led to the creation of the play he's staging right now. Urm was born from a project given to him as a representative of a foreign culture, in this case as the emigrated son of two Iranian parents who fled to Paris for a couple of years, before settling down in Canada. This project acts as a form of creative spark that Soleiman Lou uses to explore and question his own identity. The play ends with a, men with a mentally and linguistically confused Soleiman Lou, unable to assume a fully, Iranian and in a fully Iranian identity and indeed struggling between the stories that comprise his self. Iranian, French, English Canadian, French Canadian, Soleiman Lou is unable to separate the identities that, 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 make his, that make his own self and closes the play by switching between all the languages and accents he had to learn. In Deux, the comedian Emmanuel Schwartz is added inside this questioning about Soleiman Lou's identity. 
It is revealed early on that Schwartz's role is to play the character of Salimon Lou. And following the logic of Ern, the play we are shown is all about staging that show. Between the fake Manu, called Manu, and Manny himself playing as director, sparks, conflicts, and problems pertaining to Manny's discourse on identity are highlighted and further debated between the two friends. Finally, in Trois, 43 artists from Montreal, all hailing from very diverse cultural backgrounds, are thrown on the stage and are given time to discuss their own questions about their identity, with Manny and Manu taking something of a backseat inside the show of which they have lost almost all control. From mass media reviews to academic critics, the trilogy's focus on identity has, has been commented and discussed upon openly. Even Salimon Lou himself, himself in an interview with French Canadian critic Marc Cassini, openly admits that the notion of identity is central to his trilogy. With good reason, I might add, struggling, struggling with political debates about the province's independence from the federal government for years, Quebec has been, for some time now, a place where debates about identity, cultural allegiances, and immigration have always been present in the news, at least. But outside Quebec, the trilogy's focus on the controversial notion of identity has made Canadian and Euro European theater lovers quite eager to discuss the trilogy's flaws and merits. I find this particular focus to be fascinating for a number of reasons. The first comes from the fact that most of my research in theater focuses on the treatment of identity in Quebec plays. So the research is based around the idea that identity is often taken as a form of essence, an almost tangible and definable fact used to define people, an idea that I believe is wrong. On the contrary, behind the word identity lies many intricate webs of meaning and relations between a variety of abstract concepts that can't be analyzed if one takes identity as an essence. The other reason for my interest is that making the Trois Trilogy as an open-ended questioning of the notion of identity falls precisely into that trapped notion of identity as essence. As a result, as a result most reviewers, and perhaps the author of the trilogy himself, are somewhat blindsided by the notion of identity and fail to see that something much weirder is going on. Hiding behind the illusory artifice of an identity debate, what the trilogy truly proposes is a conflict between notions of the theater as a political art form and theater as a form of pure entertainment. Indeed, one could say, without being too tongue-in-cheek, that it challenges theater's identity more than it challenges identity itself. More on that later. I should note that the following case studies use of intermediate studies as an axis of pertinence could be summed up as this. I need intermediate studies to highlight differences between the live performance and the written form of the play, because these differences, differences are key to discovering how the trilogy challenges conceptions of theater, all while hiding this challenge behind the notion of identity. The other use of intermediate studies is that, in my ongoing research, I need to figure out how identity works under intermediality's point of view. As such, what I now propose is to study how the trilogy explores the notion of identity and how it reveals as much as, much as it hides its exploration of theater's purpose. The first thing I want to focus on is Soleiman Lou's apparent reliance on theatrical effects to create emotional reactions. Here are some examples, and I quote from the written form. This is a commentary by Soleiman Lou to the reader. I hope you're enjoying your reading experience. To help you better imagine the scene, I place myself like in a school group photo. I hit a bunny ears for a non-existent friend, then the bunny ears slowly transform into a piece or victory sign. Your choice, they're the same anyway. After, I raise my hand to the sky. It's a moment that I find particularly powerful, but that's my own opinion. Here, Solomon Lou insists on the power behind the representational effect that is going from a childhood mockery gesture to the well-known peace sign. But as a pure representation, representational effect and without the written commentary, during the live performance, such a sign could have quite an impact. The lack of any hint towards how it should be taken allows the public to, constru to construct its own meaning for such a gesture. As such, the political power of the gesture lies, in some ways, in the silence that follows the gesture. But the author commenting on the gesture, I would argue, undermines that potential and forces the reader to see it as the whim of, of Soleiman Lou, 
thus denying something, thus denying somewhat its political meaning. A similar effect can be observed in the following quote. I take out my cell phone and look at the video of the murder of a young girl. The lights go down, and the only strong source of light comes from my phone. The effect is awesome, really moving. I'm super proud of that moment. Try to, try to imagine you're part of the public of this play. The lights go down, everything is silent, except from the sounds of a lone cell phone, and the sounds, despite being of poor quality, are easily recognizable. The cries and lamentations of a mother and father, people shouting, the bangs of what sounds like multiple gunshots. In and of itself, the effect is indeed quite powerful. But the written form's inability to convey that uncomfortable moment, as it should be, is further undermined by the other inserting his own commentary. I'm quite proud of that moment. What should have been a heavy moment becomes mere theatrical effect. In other words, saying that the distant sound of horror is really moving paradoxically kills its horrific potential. But this is only one of many Salimalu's written commentaries that paint this place in a new light. One that had only seen the play is much, more, is much more likely to feel the tragedy that unfolds. But those that read the written form, either before or after seeing the show, can only see these effects for what they are, the author's way of creating feelings through carefully crafted delusions. In a way, Salimanu forces the reader to acknowledge that part of his play is pure artifice. Hidden behind the complex and sometimes tragic notion of identity lies an author who is keenly aware that what he is proposing is much more spectacle than true introspection. Salimanu's artificial feeling machine is further helped by his use of musical pieces to enhance the emotional response of his public. Whenever Salimanu Lu provides information on his country of origin, or when he feels somewhat nostalgia-driven, a piano piece called the Metamorphosis II by Floyd Glass is played. Without being a specialist in music, much less knowledgeable about Floyd Glass's work, I can say that this particular piece is quite efficient at highlighting the melancholy and nostalgia of the character. Other musical pieces include this particular moment when his character finds out what his mission with his plays should be. As of now, the music is tapped on to my epiphany. It's not the same music we have in Urn. It's much more epic, grand, heavy, just like my revelation. Oh, I even have chills just by writing about it. I should add that the music sounded much like what you would expect from Hollywood movie trailers, a crescendo with heavy uses of choirs and intense in instrumentals, as well as heavy use of wind motifs, that are, in fact, quite efficient when it comes to generating a form of enthusiastic excitement, even if the trailer shown is, in fact, complete and absolute crap. But here, as I said, the music is, high, is used to highlight a form of enlightenment, which is this. I quote Sally Malou, Know that as long as I exist, I will make the immigrant char uh, a character worthy of theater, dignified, an architect, not a taxi driver, not terrorist, but a man trying to anchor himself. This will make for a quite, for a quite grandiose declaration if it wasn't immediately followed by him and his friend Manu imitating warriors in the silliest of ways, or to go the author himself, this whole situation is all very grotesque. What should have been enlightenment about one's true purpose as a playwright, the act of affirming the immigrant identity, gets immediately drowned under the juvenile imitation of warfare. Could this have been the illustration of the conflict between representing an identity and falling, play, falling prey to flawed representations between the conflict between the self and the other? One can be quite doubtful when further on in the Mani and Manu end the play with the following dialogue. Manu. Yeah, we could end like that, yeah. Manu. Should we French kiss? Manu. What? Manu. Well, I thought. Many, no, we won't French kiss. Many, so there ends like this. And uh, we go on to Trois. Many, with Bukhar. Many, with Bukhar's youth, and then multiple explosions can be heard. For those not in the know, Bukhar's youth is a journalist, comedian, and all around appreciated public figure often seen on Quebec television. It may be relevant to mention that his African identity is quite evident, and in this way, perhaps, the author makes a passing reference to what is called the token diversity, spoken of and often criticized in American mass media, amongst other things. 
What's also of note is the French kiss, or lack thereof, here study Malou after a massive dispute with his friend Manu about his refusal to talk about his own identity, Manu simply doesn't want to talk about his Jewish ancestry and he doesn't care about it. Manu then simply goes for one big melodramatic cliche, cementing the reconciliation with a big fat romantic kiss. It never happens, but that's not important. What's meaningful here is that the entire identity debate is tossed aside and has, once again, pure theatrical effect. What was to be the play's mission, a dialogue between two conflicted identities, never truly happened. There was never any conflict. Only two playwrights discussing how to better make the public react and feel throughout the play, barely avoiding the, cliche, the cliches of the genre during the represented creation process. For the author, stuck with, the, with a tree, theatrical art form, it seems that it, as if reality cannot create a context that is adequate for theatrical use and represent the representation of identity. When reading or watching Solomon Lu's play, one can't help but notice that reality simply fails to, fails to create impactful stories. Of note is Solomon Lu's first family trip back to Iran and his meeting a soldier asking for their passports and luggage. At first, we are to believe this is what the soldier said to young Solomon Lu. Bache salam, where are you from? How is it? Good? Good. I'd like to be there, see what it's all about, like you. To be lucky to see. To be lucky. To have. I can't. Not now. You have a brother, Baradov? Natasi. Ichit, Nemichi. Make it like you're not really here. Don't show yourself. There's nothing for you here. Pretend you don't exist and be free. By itself, such a declaration would, that would have been quite powerful, for lack of a better term. Going back to his native culture, young Salimalu would have encountered an empathetic, almost philosophical, if not poetic soldier who is himself inspired by complex identity issues. Except, says the author right afterward, okay, maybe he didn't tell me that. He took our money, opened our luggage, took a quick glance and let us through. But what's even more fascinating is that Salimalu is not the only one going back, back and forth between augmented reality and anything that all of this is simply a huge device to make the public feel something, no matter the reason. In Troy, for example, Geoffrey, one of Manny's colleagues, asks to be at the center of the stage for a moment and takes control of the show's direction. What we then see is the slightly altered departure of Geoffrey from his own country and family Enacted by randomly chosen colleagues that are to play his crying mother, his stern father, and lovable little sister. Despite the fact that A, Geoffrey admits he has no sister at all, and B, the whole ordeal is made to be as melodramatic as possible, not for the sake of realism, but because that's what would make Geoffrey happy. The show goes on and abated, as what was to be poignant melodrama dies under the laughter of a Joffrey that is just as Solimanu, quite proud of his theatrical effects. I could go on and on with quotes and excerpts from the trilogy that construct a mini meaningful reflection on identity, identity politics, cultural backgrounds, and the like, that are always in some fashion deconstructed or parodied further on during the play. What I hope to have shown today is that for every relevant mention of identity issues, there is, at the very least, a form of deconstruction, of awareness that undermines the whole social, political, and cultural aspects of the place. And yet, we are still faced with a bit of a paradox here. Despite the numerous mentions, quotes, and excerpts that sometimes explicitly go against the idea that these plays make it their mission to tackle identity issues, the truth of the matter is that Un, Deux, and Trois have known a somewhat international success with the majority of critics and reviewers commenting on the trilogy's capacity of exploring identity. Why is that? What may be part of the answer is that audiences do not consciously associate meaning and feeling when it comes to theater. In theater and feeling, and in national performance from Expo 67 to Céline Dion, McGill professor Erwin Early proposes that one of theater's true purposes, one that necessitates more research and perhaps more recognition, that the theater art form is an excellent vehicle to make audiences feel. In fact, being exposed to that feeling device could be what theater really is all about. And the use of narratives, theatrical effects, scenic directives, and the like, while they may create meaning, also create feelings for the audience. When it comes to identity, theater operates between what representative labors, that is the construction of a rational, logical, meaningful discourse, 
and the representation of identity, and emotional labors, the use of processes that generate bodily effects and influence the audience's sentimental perception of the representative labor. What may be happening here is a form of dissociation between the representational labors and the emotional labors. As said before, representational labors are rational constructs to mobilize mental images, memories, discourses. Emotional labors happen through bodily reactions. I sense a stimuli that generates an, an affect that will later be interpret interpreted as a feeling. But feeling is born from the body, come and go with an instance, and during, during a play, a staggering amount of feelings may be generated, and just as quickly as they came, they can be forgotten. When you oppose a rational construct with a fleeting feeling, what remains the most at the end is the rational construct. And Trois is very good at making you think you're witnessing discourses about identity, all while hiding the deconstruction of the, dis of the discourses behind funny cliches and stereotypes, or even making these discourses emotionally charged. charged. So charged, in fact, that the drama of an identity conflict is simply too strong when compared to a quick laugh and one-line commentary on how all this wasn't so true after all. Finally, and I will end this work in progress on that note, it may be that the concept of the, that is identity by itself it's something of a misnomer. French philosopher François Julien surmises in Il n'y a pas d'identité culturelle, there is no cultural identity, that to defend an identity is a form of fallacy. Identity is not a fixed fact that conflicts with other existing facts. To treat it as such is to propose the idea that identities are once again pure essences, that when put in contact, threaten one another's purity. What he proposes instead is that we see identities as resources in between which, in, in between which there are differences. He, used the he uses the French word écart, slight difference in meaning. Difference then that allow these resources not only to renew themselves, but to see themselves for, for what they are. If intermediality is the, is the study of what's between, what's in between, and identity is the processes that happen, that happen when we find out what lies between cultural resources, it is my belief that one can analyze identity as a form of mediation. I want to further work on this, but that is all for today. And thank you for listening. Thank you very much. So we can have some time for questions and discussion. Yes. I'll go back to something you said before. Um, what strikes me is that on the on the difference between the text and the staging of the play, I haven't read the text but it's on the play, um, and on the self irony of the written commentary that uh, he has, uh, knowing that you fake authenticity. What, what surprises me is that um, that finally the, there's kind of a paradox because the text shows what the staging, what the staging of the play couldn't. Because when you see the play, you still, even if there's a certain distance, you still believe it's mm -hmm. real. While if you read the text, it's completely clear that he knows the it's all <clears throat> staged from yeah. beginning to the end. And that's quite interesting to me. Because it's a difference. It's, it, it, we don't have that a lot in written plays, that mm -hmm. sort of self-ironic commentary. Uh, even more particular is that there's a written form for one, mm -hmm that's completely neutral, like what we see from the usual written form of theater plays. But in Trois, in which there is the entire trilogy and what that was written, or at least published after the plays were shown worldwide, now the self-irony appears from beginning to the end. So what happened between her and Trois? One could say that in a way, Manny, the further he goes on with, the, with his plays, learns or at least is confronted to the fact or the idea that his preconceived notion of identity is inherently flawed and the only thing he can do with the finished theater plays is create er irony around it to create a form of distan distanciation. But is it so that you seem to suggest that it is necessarily so when you stage it or is it actually material that the, the specific mode of acting can more or less no, I, 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 wouldn't, I, I don't want to say it's necessary. I was just surprised because oh. I've never seen that uh, yeah. in other, uh, at least in other contemporary like, right. uh, plays oh. that are written. And the explanation, the explanation that it wasn't when it wasn't there when one was created, written, and published 
but it was there afterwards, uh, kind of emphasizes that. Yeah, but, how, um, but that was something I, I, um, I didn't quite understand is how do text and performance, um, do, are they meant to interact? Are they meant to um, be, be perceived together? No, because if you say that in one that was not yet the case and that it comes later on. So, so the, the question, my, my question would be to what extent is the knowledge of the written play um, intended by, by him to be part of the performance in a way? And, and if that's so, how did that function then for the international distribution of the play where you then get linguistic, etc., etc. I don't know if it was the many translations or in how many languages. That There's at least an English translation of that, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. um, on the difference between the written form and the representational plays, one must take the written form as another form of performance because there are theatrical effects that he simply says, I cannot recreate that replica theatrical effect in written form, but for some example in my communication. But there's also theatrical effects that simply cannot be written even as commentary. There is a part in Trois where all the actors, or about 50 of them, all present at the same time their own monologue in an overlapping fashion. So in the written form, he writes, during the play, what you would hear right now is a form of cacophony of complete of complete chaos. You could not understand anything, or at least I challenge you to understand what's happening right now. But to you, reader, I make a gift. Written form presents something more that, that has more clarity. So here are every dis distinct monologue, and there should be no cacophony in your brain while reading. So they are, in many ways, different, and they acknowledge that difference. But I mean, just simply in the chronology, mm -hmm. you know, could audiences read the play before going to see it, or was it a publication after? It, it was published afterward, and I would say if you read the play before seeing it for the first time, I believe you would not understand it in the same way as if you went to the play first and then mm -hmm. take the written form. As I say, the play is very good at hiding the fact that it's not mm -hmm. really about identity, whereas the written form with its form of self-irony and awareness really is better at highlighting it, I think. Which, which I think is, is an interesting, I mean, it's like, you know, um, going to see a thriller and already know how to grab a book. <laughs> like spoiler, that. yeah. Um, because that, that would mean that there's really very clearly two ways of perceived play, that is a experience like you have, where you go and then discover afterwards that you know you miss I mean that there were some that, that some uh, uh, that it was reframed by the written form right? whereas if you have read it before and then if you now would stage the play again you know, mm -hmm. then people would come and having sort of a, a duplicity in the perception which would all the time reframe what's happening on the stage through what you already know and and uh, project into every action that you see. So that is, I mean, that is that's quite interesting if you have these kinds of um, uh, uh, temporalities mm -hmm. that are part of the, the sort of life career of the play in a way. And so there's a before and an after in a, in a way also in the perception sphere of the play. Yes. Then, then I, I take one more, which I, because you very strongly stress the importance of the intermediality concept in, in, in your, for your work and for your study of, of that play. Can you expand on that a bit more, how that translates into, I mean, this is probably too big a question. <laughs> how you can, can you translate that into a Can you respond to expanding your security of thesis right now? <laughs> but uh, no, the, the methodology that that entails, if you refer to Yes. Uh, what I do usually is look at 
somewhat uh, uh, intermedial theory. What is intermediality all about? How does it happen? How does it work? And then I look at the concept of identity. How is it defined? How is it challenged? And how it may be integrated in intermediate studies. So that's why one of my central questions is where does identity fit in all this? Is it, as some would propose, a form of essence that enters in conflict between other essences? I take intermediality as a form of anti-essentialist approach. So I say, no, this can't be a case. Otherwise, identity can't be a thing but I exist, so at some point, identity should fit somewhere in the bigger picture of intermediality. So what I try to explore right now is the fact that identity is a form of mediation, or perhaps a form of different mediations that are influenced by other mediations as intermediality proposes. How do you think, I think that is a, that is a very productive approach. Um, but, and it's also very challenging because you, you are dealing here with a play which on its, let's say, content level mm -hmm. thematizes exactly that issue of identity. We're talking about the identity of a person, migrant, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, whereas for intermediality, the issue of identity is one indeed foundational uh, because intermediality means a critique of the idea of a mediated, of a media identity mm -hmm. uh, or media specificity. Uh, so there is in fact two layers that are coming into the, into the picture here and how do you articulate these two levels? Uh, let me think about it for a couple of seconds. I'm not quite sure I understand every uh, concept of life here. Um, so, I mean, there's, there's one level where clearly you can in interrogate um, in, let's say, current discussions on social issues, mm -hmm. you know, the way of I how identity politics uh, are working and indeed in, in some uh, 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 parts of that, that field are used in a very essentialist, um, exclusive, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, way. I mean, the, the mouvement identitaire in, in France um, is is uh, would be an example of a very exclusive view on, on French identity. Um, and uh, so, so there is there's that level versus uh, the idea of a multiple identity, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But for intermediality as a as a <coughs> approach or as a perspective on media, and the question is one that um, thematizes the fact that every medium in itself, when seen as something that, that has an identity, excludes actually a lot of practices that are there in that you know, the whole medium identity. I think part of my answer would be that the discourse on essential identity is in and of itself, an accurate discourse, I take it as it is, even if it's philosophically wrong or there are some flaws about it, it's still present, at least in the form of, uh, at least in the form of Quebec play. So one must take it in, into consideration. Mm -hmm. And then there's that, that other notion of identity that's more hidden, mm -hmm. that's less politically debated, that is part of the individual studies. So those two layers, there's one I say, it is apparent, it is, in my opinion, philosophically flawed, it, it's still part of a public discourse. And then there's the real, in a way, identity that is not essential within nature. That must also be analyzed in the place I uh, do my research. I can imagine that the topic of identity is also in particular relevant if you uh, place it in our militarized culture and society, and society where we are provided with so many platforms and tools mm -hmm. to stage our identity, yes. to refer mm -hmm. to our identity, to play with our identity, to be aware that our identity more and more becomes something which is described in terms of all kinds of preferences that are carefully traced by huge companies that try to blah, 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 blah. So in that sense, the performativity of the self in terms of identity is a huge mm -hmm. topic. So yes. 
but indeed very relevant. I, I think I could sum, sum it up in this way. There is a material identity that is staged. That's the one I, I find flawed. That's part of the public discourse and the mass media and social media and the internet, of course. And there's the intermedial identity, the one that is hidden and the one that should be analyzed, all the while taking, uh, taking in consideration the staged identity of the theory. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you. Good. That um, brings us to our third presentation this morning by François Jardin Gomez, also of the University of Montréal, <laughs> where he is writing a thesis. And we are again in the field of Quebec theater now with his presentation of opacity and transparency in contemporary Quebec theater. Lord yours. Thank you. So, um, kind of like David, I want to profess this uh, presentation by asking for your indulgence since it's my first ever presentation in English. I'll try to make it as clear as possible, but please accept my excuses in advance for any errors. Now, um, the opposition or duality between artifice and authenticity is something I've been interested in for a few years. What I want to address today are the relationships between a series of pairings, authenticity and artifice, opacity and transparency, violence and speech, fiction and reality or real. Um, my current research examines how in Quebec contemporary theater, violence is mediated by speech acts rather than actions by language rather than bodies, uh, which changes in a way the spectator's perception of the characters. My belief is that the plays can lead us to a new understanding of the relationship between realism and theater by way of a new understanding of the relationship between violence and speech. But I'll talk less today about violence and speech and more about the question of theater and reality or artifice and authenticity. But what I'll try to do is to show how the pairing uh, transparency in opacity is at work using a play by Etienne Lepage as an example. So in order to achieve this, I'll, start, uh, I'll have to start with a few theoretical considerations, which are uh, these few quick announcements uh, about performativity, theatricality, realism, and spectatorship involvement in theater. I'll probably simplify a couple of things along the way, but bear with me for a few minutes and we'll get to the thick of it. So, uh, since the 1960s, at least, the opposition between performance or performativity and theater or theatricality has seen uh, devaluation in practice of speech, of saying in favor of actions, of doing. This implicates that the body is usually considered to be real and capable of showing nothing but the truth. On the other hand, speech is an art of artifice. It allows lying and treachery. Now, violence in itself is generally defined as authentic, as real, especially when it is aimed towards the body, be it mine or someone else's. Now, of course, violence uh, or physical damage can be faked in many ways, as theater, cinema, or even wrestling have proved it for many years, but performative actions and performative violence are seen as something that's inherently real on stage, even if or when it is encompassed in a fictional play. Now, one could argue that we are still in an essentialist paradigm, uh, David talked a bit about that, meaning that theater still encourages the real, intense, live relationship between actors and spectators. Now, in Quebec, for instance, um, a huge majority of actors or directors focus on trying to bring reality on stage, firmly convinced that this is uh, what counts. But to say that theater is more than anything else presence of flesh and blood is to say that what's natural is superior to what's artificial. What strikes me is that even today where technology is everywhere in theater, this distinction is still important, but in a slightly different way. More than technology or artificiality versus liveness or authenticity, the duality between fiction and reality, between theatricality and performativity, is still present, even if many theories have shown how it changed. I also have to say that I'm interested in intermediality outside of technology, 
Um, the play study, well, the play study today, uh, has no apparent use of technology when uh, it was staged outside of sound or lights practice that are now more than common in theater. But if even an actor's body is mediated, if presence is always mediation, let's suppose that words are two and see how they can work together or against each other, depending on the case. So contemporary theater, at least here, but I'm fairly sure it's the same in most part of the world, does not pretend to give a total illusion of reality, if theater even once pretended to do that. Theater today can't rely on immediacy in front of the viewer. As we know, immediacy lets the users experiment their need of illusions. They rely on transparency. Opacity works in a different way. In fact, opacity is understood as the pleasure that users get when they see or they feel the different processes of mediation to see them interact with each other. It's the capacity to put the spectator's focus on how things are made, and theater is riddled with it. But of course, there's also a metaphorical um, conception of transparency and opacity. Transparency is what's uh, clear, uh, self-evident. Opacity is what's uh, unclear. But whether plays try to be illusions of reality or not, wherever they are on each end of the spectrum between dramatic and post-dramatic theater, the spectator is a major part of the intermedial process. So as Samuel Weber explains in Tiafi Kelby as medium, that's quite small. Um, I'll read it anyway. Um, so as Weber explains, the role of the audience, be it spectator, the listener or reader is fundamental. There is, he says, a power of theatricality that is specific neither to theatrical representation as such, nor to narrative, the power of putting the other on the spot. The addressee is called upon to bear witness to a turn of events that as such can never be seen. So keep that in mind as I present our theater and in this instance, contemporary Quebec theater works with or maybe against reality. Marvin Carlson argues that, sorry, I still can't see it. So we can leave it like that. So uh, Carlson argues that the function of theater has never been to provide an exact duplication of everyday life, as realism suggested, nor appeal secondary derived imitation of life as Plato charge, but rather a heightened, intensified variation on life not so much a mirror as an exploration and celebration of possibility. Um, theater then could and should explore the possibilities of reality instead of copying its modes. Then if this opposition uh, between fiction and reality upon which the dialectic theatricality and performativity is founded, if that distinction is no longer existent, and that's the third uh, quote, theatricality, uh, says Webb, uh, says uh, Carlson, can admit to all those qualities that have historically been cited against it, that it is artificial, removed from everyday life. Since it shows voluntarily for the viewer the virtuosity of theater, its artifice, and its authenticity at the same time. So all this being said, let's see how it can translate into contemporary Quebec theater. Um, the plays are often presented as enigmas where the story has no clear resolution. The spectator has to decide what the play is about from the different clues and pieces he can gather from the, the play. This opacity of meaning is, for example, caused by characters that speak to no one in particular, uh, meaning that we can't really know who they are talking to and sometimes about what. The plays actively show their distance from their source, which could be reality, they are actively and voluntarily impenetrable. Furthermore, in Quebec theater, violence seems, seems to come from language. Violent language or speech is now commonplace. These problems created by the relationships between violence, speech, and character can also let us reflect, reflect on the relationship and specifically the opposition between fiction and reality in a new perspective. And that's the last long citation um, quote you'll have. Now, the opposition isn't interesting anymore if you use the concept of unsafe realism that Roberta Barker and Kim Solga developed in 2007. 
And safe realism supposes that playwrights use an aesthetic of paradox and contradiction to get out of realism while using some of its resources. Thus, the plays, their meaning, uh, their meanings, their ideas, and so on, are unsafe. Barker and Solga explain uh, theater should hope for expectation alongside, alongside its failure, empathetic connection alongside uncertain allegiance, and degrees of spectatorial pleasure alongside visceral discomfort as audiences work to figure out exactly how they ought to feel, what they ought to think. Imagining realism as a, a genre driven by rather than terrified of paradox and inconsistency will, we suggest, allow for the development of a fresh theory and practice of stage realism that first accounts more completely for the complexities and contradictions inherent in viewing a stage world that purports to be real, but of course can never be. And second, attempts to harness the discomfort that may arise in realism's watching, using that discomfort for politically productive ends. More so, they argue um, that there's no such thing as the real, as we know it, or reality, but different experiences of reality. So as you can guess, uh, the line between authentic or real and artifice or fake is getting even blurrier. Then the spectator's role is crucial in deciding what's real or not, what's authentic and what's artificial. My belief is that when we approach these plays, it's always both authentic, authentic and artificial at the same time. I believe that these plays work between opacity and transparency, as for instance, instance Etienne Lepage's Rouge Girl, which has been translated in English for staging into Al Red. I only have excerpts of this translation. I'll use it when I can, but sometimes it will be mine, and I think the difference will be very clear. So on the right, if you can see it, there's uh, the translation, and I still put on the left um, uh, the, the text in French. So uh, Rouge Gueule is separated in 17 scenes that are not connected narratively. Uh, in Bad Habit, one of the characters, Bamoko, which was uh, in fact, played by Mani Salimanu, uh, confesses that now he suffers from PTSD. Uh, he arrived in Quebec, he saw horrors uh, of war in his country. It's a very short scene, about two pages, and the end of the monologue goes like this. Now I can't sleep. I tried to kill myself twice. I'm on antidepressants and anxiolytics. He takes a little pill uh, from a small box. He laughs suddenly. I'm just kidding, I was born here. Those are Tic Tacs, which are uh, Brett Mintz. So the potential transparency of the language, the authenticity of the situation, what this character feels and testifies is instantly nullified. Uh, that scene is obviously a play on theater's nature and our taste for feeling. Uh, it's even a play on documentary theater on a certain impossibility of a real testimony on stage but it also works as a reflection, as a thought on authenticity. Now, the playwriting of Lepage is fundamentally interesting because it seems to go from one extreme to the other. Either he writes story-driven plays with characters, twists, and surprising revelations, theater, or he writes fragmented plays in which individual scenes are united by a same ID rather than a unified story, as is Rouge Girl. By the way, and that's what I'm interested in. Um, their functionality is similar. The characters are not more real in the traditional plays than in the fragmented ones. The fragmented plays are not more performative than the traditional ones. There's no truth to discover behind the speech or the actions of these characters. In other words, what you see and what you hear is what you get. The question of authenticity and artifice is almost irrelevant. Now, most of Rouge Girl's scenes are monologues, and they show characters for whom violent speech is the only way to interact with someone. It echoes their desire to be heard and understood. They are also animated by their desire to live and to think and to say on the limit of taboos of what can be done, but mostly what can be said. More interestingly, some of them know that they navigate in troubled waters, and they show conscience of the violence of their monologue. So for instance, Dave, and that's the, the one uh, up top, in his monologue about ugly people, stops himself midway and says, we're talking about real shit here. I'm talking about real shit. We're far from polite conversation. This is heavy. We're not kidding anymore. The implication being that he's talking to the audience. 
In another scene, Francis does the same thing and reveals to the audience uh, a sexual fantasy about a classmate. One below. The down kind of shy, I'd want her to want it too. Is it possible that she might want it? I'm gonna ask her. Can you ask that? Hey, I'd like to lick your anus. Would you let me lick your anus? Can you ask that? Now, for your information, he comes to the conclusion that no, you can't ask that to someone. Um, <laughs> Rougegal also reflects on someone's conflict with normative language, as in another scene, which is called Fists of Fury, in which uh, Michel tries to reveal to his girlfriend that he wants to try sodomy, but his own speech is always interrupted and shows that he reflects on how to say things. That's uh, in part why the text is disposed that way. So every um, return of the text shows that he starts anew. So it goes like this. Okay, so let's start over. I, I need to talk to you about something. Basically, what I want to say is they act, no. Other couples, they, that's what I talk to you, I want about. We need to talk. The act, the act of sodomy. Okay, yeah. Um, in the staging of the play, and you have a, a small picture, uh, the actor sits still on a chair trying to find his words. Body and speech are both expressing the same thing, the difficulty of openly speaking about uh, what could be called a sensible matter. Uh, the discussion is never finished as the scene ends without a closing argument. The final words are, it's just that we can't let that, we're not gonna. Uh, and then the, the, the scene changes. So the play also contains, uh, contains some violent scenes or actions that should be done live, and not live in the most global sense of the word. The ninth scene, National Sport, shows another character, André, who wants to bash Dave's head in with a golf club. Uh, André says it himself at the beginning. The whole scene is constructed on that ID. So you have this is the beginning, and then I skip all the way to the end. So the scene opens with, oh, you were there. Don't worry, it's not what you think. I'm only going to bash in his skull with big golf club swings. Uh, so what we have is an unrealistic situation, as you can see on this picture. One character, uh, Dave on the left, stands there. Um, he doesn't speak while André explains what he thinks and what he wants to do to the audience. There's no illusion there. The stage direction that ends the scene indicates, and I'm going back, André resumes, uh, uh, the, the, the action resumes, André runs towards Dave and bashes in his call with big uh, golf club swings. However, uh, as you can see, there were no screens or any technological means on stage that could have helped in showing this action. As you can guess, um, the director chose to interrupt the action by suddenly shutting the lights to transition to the next scene. Now, of course, we as spectators don't need to see an actor's head being bashed uh, for real by a golf club and to show this action would cause uh, what we could call some concrete problems of representation. <laughs> then again, I'm more interested in the tension between body and speech in this scene. And once again, the speech act presides over the action, even if both of them help the character's uh, understanding. For me, these characters are uh, profoundly interesting because they're voluntarily revealing themselves, but in mostly violent way. Uh, Marina Merlo was talking yesterday about extimity, which is voluntarily showing your intimacy, invoking the other's gaze and reacting to it, and I think it's very much in play here. Whether what they reveal is real or not, they believe it to be, or they need it to be. That they reveal it more by speaking to the audience rather than by living it is always reminding the audience that the real view on stage is a construct. Oh, I'm almost finished. Contemporary plays engage realism by language, most of the time by using the spectators as receivers. They now have a joint liability. Uh, the situation is not, is not realist. Lepage's play is constructed in snippets or in quick scenes, some of which don't even have a real conclusion. But each scene, each scene can feel real, but the play as an ensemble shows its own artificiality. 
In all of this, only the language remains real, or what, rather, it's what mediates reality. There's no deconstruction of speech, no creation of words, for instance. It's all, it's all ways, uh, common speech. The language of these plays also mediates the real of the viewer, what's real for the characters, and what's unspeakable, but they still try to give uh, an account of. Language, furthermore, furthermore, shows how verbal discourses transparency is an effect, if not an illusion. Think again about uh, the first example, Bamako's mon monologue about his own PTSD. So following this logic, uh, the duality of transparency and opacity, or uh, theatricality and performance, is still at work, but they no longer oppose each other. Uh, they are totally in sync. They can't be separated. Contrary to performative or post-dramatic theater, in Lepage's work, the body doesn't reveal anything, or it reveals only for a short while. Uh, language is alternatively, or at the same time, clouding or revealing what these characters want. But uh, body and language both shape and influence how the viewer sees, feels, and experiments these characters and these plays. These situations are not synonymous with an authentic aesthetic experience. In fact, I would argue that the experience of these plays is neither authentic or artificial, but always in between, moving from one to another. Thank you. Thank you. So we've got time for questions and discussions. Yes, thank you. Um, you said at one point uh, in the last few minutes of your speech, uh, speech and language in in the is what mediates reality. Mm -hmm. And I'm 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 focusing on, on the world reality because mm -hmm. the, the, the language in in Rochegel seems to be a perfect example of an opaque language. Mm -hmm. And I'm referring to especially to the um, uh, uh, speech about the, the real shit. Mm -hmm. uh, that is, the real shit that is uh, uh, put in play here is not what he said, nor is no. it what he's about to say. It, it is the very fact that he's saying mm -hmm. that this is the real mm -hmm. shit. So the reality that it that it, that is mediated or through this speech is not. Do you see where I'm going with this? Mm -hmm. uh, that that the, the it seems that the language is not mediating reality. It is reality itself, and and by by the act of speech is creating the, the speech is is uh, 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 creating reality itself, and not the other way, uh, other way, other way around. Um, yeah. Um kind of thing I understand what you're trying to say. Um, but we will have the conversation in French afterwards. It's going to be easier. Um, of course, there's, there's always quotation marks around reality. Um, that's the first point. Um, I don't know if language creates reality. I think language creates its own, well, we can maybe call it reality or art artificiality, or then a new word that uh, synthesizes both of it, meaning that language creates its own reality at this uh, precise moment in time. Uh, yes, I would agree on that. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, what's important, I think, is, 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 is this idea that the, uh, in, uh, in, in this, in this uh, dramaturgy, the uh, violence uh, it is not physical. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's there, but it's not physical, and it's uh, it's uh, it does. So the, the question is is is, is the question. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, it only exists uh, in, uh, in, in 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 words, by words, and um, it's it's a bit amazing that uh, uh, an author. Uh, they write today with all the means that the theater uh, has now in terms of uh, equipment, digital equipment, acting, and so on. 
decides to to to, to rely on the on, on, on speech to uh, on words uh, to to express and to create because it's more than the expression of violence it is violence yeah. right yeah yeah uh, i think it is um now there's always the question of the difference between the author and the, the director that stages the play but yes that was impressive and it was one example but it works with other uh, other plays by lepage and other plays uh, in contemporary quebec theater um what's impressive is that it's always um, language always creates that violence uh, and even when they try to stage it uh, differently uh, since language created that violence it's as if the stage cannot uh, do it again the staging cannot uh, emphasize on that violence they have to find other ways because um, speech uh, took control of that violence uh, so yes that's that's something i didn't want to get into uh, necessarily today but that's the major point of one of the major points that i'll try to uh, work in my thesis. Okay, okay. Uh, I, I think this, this question is the, uh, the, this uh, paradigm by, by Austin concerning, yeah. mm. and post Austin, let's say, yeah. uh, concerning the uh, performativity of language. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, so, and I think this is, there is a kind of criticism of Austin mm -hmm. in the presentation, uh, which is that uh, uh, performativity, uh, Austin and post Austin relies to. Uh, there is two actually uh, symbolic actions, mm -hmm. like you know the, the, the example of uh, John Murray, uh, this is just symbolic. Uh, here, there is something that is physically, I would say, experienced by, by, by uh, language create, creates a real, uh, in the fight, mm -hmm. creates a physical reality, violence, which is <laughs> symbolic. So there is something going on here. There is a space. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I think, I mean, I, I would agree with the exception that indeed Austin has chosen very conventional mm -hmm. examples in order to explain what he means by performativity of language. But the thing is that by uttering a speech, by performing the speech, something comes into the world and thus changes the state of the world. I mean, the, the moment he pronounces the word sodomy, mm -hmm. this is there. So then it becomes an issue, it becomes a reality, etc. that has to be debated. I and mean, this is in fact uh, something that we all have experienced when we fell in love for the first time. And, and you know, and you delay and delay and delay the moment where you, you, say, you say it because you're afraid of being rejected and, oh, and then right. that has changed. Altering you, the alphabet. Altering your reality. Yeah, right. <laughs> so completely. And I think that that is the, the that is an example that Austin could have used, mm. which I think would have been <laughs> very gripping to almost everybody. Um, yeah, well, the, the, it, it's true. Then, then again, on this precise example, uh, even when he utters it, the the end, the the, the following speech um, does not uh, it, that that it exists and that at. It, it has been said doesn't change really anything in this scene because there's no conclusion we don't even know uh, when it the, the scene ends uh, what in what way did this uh, discussion discussion advance we don't know what has been said we don't know what uh, the other person thinks and then we don't even know if there's a chance that by it being said they are closer to uh, eventually doing it but what we know is that there is an issue now there between them and that the mm. other will have to react to that one way or mm. the other even yeah. if we don't learn about mm. it but you know our perception of the scene is radically transformed because mm. that's been out mm. Mm. Yeah. sorry for my English um I agree with you but um but Austin I think it's um perhaps the same case because uh, the theater is the, the, the church. It's uh, when you, you come to the theater, it's um, symbolic, it's uh, a ritual, like uh, the church. Mm -hmm. uh, I marry you and I fuck you. 
it's the same in a uh, kind of rituals so there is symbolism mm -hmm. so it, it's too performative yeah. i think mm -hmm. but i think if from these short fragments yeah. of text um, what you observe is that there is uh, much self-reference in this yeah so also an awareness of the situation they're mm -hmm. in how so, their behavior should be yeah. taken and so on and what could be a challenge on the one side you can uh, stage it in such a way that you take this casual language mm -hmm. as real yes. and stage it in a quite realistic way mm -hmm. or unless uh, uh, the 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 everydayness of the text you can stage it in such a way that you create a kind of distance yes. mm -hmm. which allows the audience to i mean it reminds me very much about a staging of dutch play the family by uh, lodewijk de boer which was recently which was a play from 75 and staged now again and in 75 it was real shocking because of the words used and the, the, the strong language and the explicit references and so on and what they did now is to stage it in such a realistic way that it was completely mm -hmm. uh, filled and then you more or less okay okay but whereas i think if you create more distance then it creates more entrances for the audience yeah. to mm -hmm. to deal with it mm -hmm. yourself mm -hmm. And to relate it to yourself. Well, it, it, it's kind of, it's not that clear now, but it, it's kind of what this, this staging did because it's quite a, it's like an open uh, apartment uh, in where uh, every character come and go, but it's kind of a neutral space yeah, uh, yeah. in itself. So it's, uh, it is um, an unrealistic staging. And yes, I think it's why, it's also why. Um, the speech is that important and it has, uh, has such an effect mm -hmm. uh, but um, if the staging was completely realistic uh, maybe the experience would be different definitely mm -hmm. but, but we've never seen it uh, in all these plays uh, in the past years there's never been a play written like that that had a realistic staging and for me that's uh, quite that that's not just a coincidence there's something there that yeah. has to be explored because it's mm. too um it's too common that they, yeah there's something to to, to investigate one, one could say well that there's the level of the station but there's also the the level of performing the speech act. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and i mean if the speech act is performed realistically yeah. uh, that that has an impact and you could I mean, the fragments of text that mm -hmm. you presented, you can imagine hundreds of ways yeah. of pronouncing that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and that, that could change enormously mm -hmm. the perception. Yeah. I just had something I actually read. There is uh, also, also I, I, thinking at it, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking at the acting. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, 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 there is some, it's, it's unclear whether it's uh, realistic or not. Uh, uh, sometimes it uh, because it is also involved in. It doesn't. It's not a director itself, but he it works very yeah. closely with this director, so he's involved in building mm. something. Well, the, um, he, he didn't say that, but uh, another um, playwright and director, Kisela uh, Point, said. And I think it was in one of your classes when he mm. came. Uh, he said that for him, the, the most common thing in theater today and in Quebec theater is that everyone tries to do at the same time Arthur and Brecht. So everyone mm. tries <laughs> at the same time to be very real and then distantiated. Uh, depending on the scene and sometimes almost at the same time, which is, yeah, yeah, uh, which sometimes works and sometimes really doesn't because um, it's quite difficult to do. But yet the, there's something there too. We never know and it plays on, on what the characters um, project because we never really know if they believe it or not or if, they, uh, if this is really what they feel or if they are just trying to provoke uh, someone, be it the audience or someone else. Um. Um, 
uh, I know that you work on the, the matter of uh, catharsis in your mm -hmm. thesis. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering, uh, as in, in, in is there any cathartic aspect to the violence shown in, in the Rouge Girl? As there could be, because a, 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 I, I remember a, a, a showing of, uh, I think it was like Santi or Ritu mm -hmm. uh, in the, the TNM, and the representation of violence was uh, pretty graphic. I mean, mm -hmm. a shooting was a shooting. Uh, the actor had a gun, it was on the stage, and was shooting onto crap. Uh, so it was the other opposite mm -hmm. of, what you, of your presenting. And I was wondering, is there this 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 cathartic element in the Rouge Girl, as we would argue that there is in our depiction of violence? Um, the short answer is no, I don't think so. Um, the longer one is uh, really long, but um, uh, no, I don't. I don't think so because there's a there's a liberation in Muawad, and that's what I did in, in my masters in, in the story that the characters feel relieved because they learn something, and there's a real story that liberates everyone at the end. I don't think there's a liberation for any anyone in the in Girl, neither for the characters nor for the spectators. They just have, they have to express that. Yeah, they so have to tell it and to show it. It's their way to interact or connect with someone. But I don't think that expression uh, has a, a appeasing so violence, uh, effect that catharsis the violence has. is not the mean to an end but it is the end itself yeah yeah mm -hmm. it's 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 the way we uh, interact with each other and that's just it there's no that's why i was trying trying to say there's nothing behind that mm -hmm. violence there's, there's just that violence in itself there, there are no good and bad no uh, characters in, in, uh, no so there's no, no. 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 Yeah, all good and mm -hmm. yes. It's very difficult to judge and make a judgment. Yeah. So the kind of system doesn't work really. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, thank you. 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 Thank you.